And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the, upcom the upcoming, oh, uh, I'd say, t I don't, I don't say, um, dark... I'd say I'd say dark steampunk, ish kind of thing. Steampunkish, yes. Yeah, ex lumine, and I just screwed yes. up my intro. I just screwed up my intro, but we're but it is what it is. The one and only Nicolo Zovetti. How are you doing today, man? Thank you for inviting me here. I'm good, thanks. Yep. Yeah. So it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Hmm. So, with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? <laughs> um, wow, uh, this question made me chuckle, mostly because my introduction with uh, tabletop, tabletop RPG um, was not very good. I mean, my first time playing d d uh, was an horrendous experience. Mostly because I realized only years later that my first uh, game master at the time was terrible. I mean, for many years I uh, haven't touched the tabletop RPG, mostly because of this. I remember uh, this master specifically trying to railroad us or telling that we could not do uh, things or punishing us for being creative, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I entered the hobby fairly later than most of my peers. Uh, but I started with, uh, officially I started with the third edition. Mm -hmm. uh, then we went back a little bit. We tried the old uh, red box, mostly because we wanted to see how was Dungeons and Dragons uh, in its first years. Mm -hmm. And then we stick for, uh, we stick with uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, third edition for, I don't know, about, 10 years. Uh, we, all, we played uh, many other games, actually, but uh, this was my first love, I guess. Mm -hmm. So with, with that in mind, when it came, when it came to um, the development of, um, of Ex Lumine, what, what would you say was the um, what would you say was the spark that started it? Hmm. Um, well, actually, after trying many many games, I have to say, uh, but playing, uh, but after playing D and D third edition for so many years, mm -hmm. we eventually decided to play the fifth edition. We did it for almost three years. Uh, we played a very long campaign, which ended uh, six months ago, and we immediately uh, understood that yes, fifth edition is good. It changes a lot of things, but we didn't like the lack of character pro and progression and personalization, I guess. I mean, mm -hmm. we loved the idea of removing unnecessary crunchiness from the third edition, but we also uh, did not like the other paths, uh, the streamlining of uh, fifth edition. So I guess we just decided to create our game, uh, not basically just... Uh, I don't know, uh, an expansion for the third edition, but trying to create something that gives the, at least the illusion of uh, personalization and uh, in-depth uh, without uh, uh, punishing the rule set with extreme crunchiness. Yeah. So that was the main spark. Also, uh, because at the time, the only um, dark fantasy game uh, uh, similar to my idea that I, that I found was uh, Simbarom. And so I just decided to to try to create something original and new. Yeah, and now when it comes to ex when it comes to ex Lumine, I think you you described it as a um as a post as a post apocalyptic uh, fantasy. Mm. Um, yes, and in that regard, it's interesting that you that you bring up um, Simbarum as a as a um. As a as a um, as 
a early this case, an early case. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the first thing, the first thing that that was curious that was curious about with the early, with the early development of it was in when you when you when you were trying when you were developing it early on was the, was the early draft um, a bit more straight fantasy or or were you planning to integrate um, more tech punk elements from the beginning? Um. Well, in the early drafts, mm -hmm. it was more something like uh, yes, and a classic uh, high fantasy game, yes. Mm -hmm. But it was more something more similar to Simbarong, yeah. yes. Uh, but when we expanded on the theme of uh, using souls, uh, that is the central theme of Ex Lumine, mm -hmm. we also decided that it would have been a great idea to expand further on it. So. Uh, what if in this world there's no um, oil and everything is powered by souls? So there are machines and guns or something like that, mm -hmm. and, and everything is powered by souls. And so it became more, uh, well, I shouldn't say steampunk because steampunk is more, is, is usually uh, more colorful, um, more enjoyable, whereas the diesel punk theme mm -hmm. is more darker uh, there's technology but you have the feeling that everything is going to crumble or at least that is that is unstable mm -hmm. that is the main theme of the game i guess yeah and within with within that you of course now within the setting of course you have the you have two you have the on two on two sides of the coin, the corruption, um, which which spawns the tenebris and mm -hmm. the um so and the soul binders. Mm -hmm. Um. Now the now one of one of the first questions I have is the one of the key one of the key items with soul binders is the binding lanterns. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm cu I'm curious what I'm curious why. What was the inspiration to go with a lantern for the for the concept of soul binders? Um, well, um, the inspiration mm -hmm. came uh, one night drinking with a friend. He told me about uh, I think it was an ancient Japanese language and uh, legend mm -hmm. where there was this hero that could uh, summon spirits from. Um, And we lost him. Hang on a sec. We'll get him back shortly. Oh, welcome back. Everything crashed. Sorry. <laughs> no um, worries, man. So, uh, we were talking about a Japanese language where an hero called someone um, um, spirits mm -hmm. from a canteen or something like that. Yeah. And I like the concept of uh, encasing souls inside something, and I decided to pick a lantern. Yeah. Uh, at the time, I think I was also playing uh, League of Legends, where there is this uh, hero uh, that basically traps souls within his lantern. So mm -hmm. I guess I just put the two things together, and I created the concept. Yeah. Um. Now with it now of course now of course there's the um there's the fa there's the fact that you have um um fi five five races with five races within within it each each with or whether I'd, whether I'd call them races or factions I I'd le I'll leave that up to you but with each of them um you can you had set up the you had set up their own particular area and their own um their own insignia mm -hmm. um whether it be whether it be just standard humans the the cons and and so on um how when it comes when it comes to each of each of those um factions um 
how much of a factor does that play into what sort what sort of um, soul binder that they might end up leaning towards? Um, well, when, when creating the soul binders and their well, the game is races. Mm -hmm. We started from a narrative approach. So, for example, the Cans were once humans mm -hmm. uh, worshipping a volcano. So we started from that point. So you have this volcano that has uh, some kind of magical powers that mm -hmm. repel uh, corruption and tenebris. And so we started from this idea asking ourselves, so what kind of soul binders will be appropriate in this context? So they worship fire, so I, I guess there should be I don't know, a pyromancer or something mm -hmm. like that. Or maybe a warrior that wields fire or a berserk mostly because they are ogres and mm -hmm. orcs and it is fitting. So um, we didn't have a, a defined approach. We just used our imagination and we tried to create everything uh, according to the um, idea we have we had about the world, mm -hmm. uh, so that's it. Yep. And with with that in mind, so now you guys are using a D, you guys are using a D one hundred system. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And when it and of course, and of course, this is a roll under D one hundred system. I have to, I yes. have to clarify. I have to clarify that because while well, there are some roll high ones, looking at you, roll master. Um, <laughs> what was what was the reasoning for pick for picking the percentile dice? Um, mostly um, a design reason. Mm -hmm. the, fir the reasons. The first one is that it is intuitive. I mean, it, roll hunter, it is intuitive per se. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you use a roll hunter D100 system, it is extremely intuitive. Let's just say you have 16 constitution mm -hmm. and you have to perform a constitution test. You know that you have 60% chance. I mean, there's no uh, calculation. There's nothing distracting you from role playing. There's no... Um, I have a plus one, which is a plus uh, five percent uh, on the, the on the D20. It is sixty percent, and that's it. You mm -hmm. can concentrate on something else, and also because uh, um, it creates space for tweaking and personalization. For example, in Simbarom, you have the roll under mechanic, but in relation to the D20, and it is less clear mm -hmm. because you have a plus one or minus one, which is 5%. And again, mm -hmm. an, an unknown experienced player might not realize how impactful is a, that plus one or that minus one. And But there it is, you have less margin because here you have um, a space that goes from zero to 100. So you can, for example, uh, work with the balancing uh, with the uh, plus 5, plus 10, plus 20. When you have a d20, uh, I mean, there's not that margin. So we decided to pick this system for these reasons, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, one, one other thing I'm a bit, one, one other thing I'm a bit, I'm a bit curious about is, because you, you had mentioned Simbaurum, which, um, you, which, uses uses a roll under um a lot of t a lot of times when people think when people think of roll under um systems the two that always come to mind for them is um warhammer and rune quest were were was your group um familiar with either of those um beforehand uh yes uh especially warhammer um initially we we, we worked also with the idea of uh, including degrees of successes and failures. Uh, in the final version of, as in Warhammer, in the final version of our game, we are going to include, let's just say, an optional system yeah. where you can, for example, calculate the degrees of su successes 
and failures on known combat tests. Uh, so, for example, you have to jump over a cliff. You fail by five points. Maybe that's not a failure. That's just a minor failure. So, for example, you land, but you, um, I don't know, break your knee or something like that. Uh, but mm, we are not going to uh, build the entire system around it as in Warhammer because, uh, I don't know, we didn't feel the necessity of doing this. But yes, answer to your, to your question, we got inspired also by those two games. Mm -hmm. And in, the, in that regard, do you, do you, ha um, do you have... Um, plans for critical successes and critical failures, or is that not in the cards? Uh, yes, and in the quick starter version, there are no, uh, let's just say, racial abilities because they are part of the creation system. But mm -hmm. one of the um, <clears throat> one of the racial abilities of the humans is to basically avoid uh, critical failures. So yes, with the result of uh, 100 you critically fail with the result of one you critically succeed so yes mm -hmm. um, critical successes also uh, play I will not say an important part but uh, an interesting part in combat as uh, they allow you to perform um, special actions mm -hmm. for example uh, scoring a one uh, while uh, swinging an axe uh, might might not might not just might just not uh, get you double de damage, but for example, decapitate your uh, your opponent or yeah. performing something like that. And that was another thing I found it I found um, interesting is the um, is the pain track that you got, that you guys are utilizing. Mm -hmm. um, was was some was something like that to to make sure that um, encounters are not just an attempt to whittle down some um, character's toughness. Mm. Uh, what do you mean exactly? Because maybe I did not understand um, your question. I'm, I'm specifically referring to how wounds are implemented, mm -hmm. and I could see this kind. I could see this kind of thing to be a means of enforcing how li enforcing the um, setting as well as making sure that combat encounters don't aren't um, so aren't solely reliant on hit points to determine danger oh, oh yes absolutely yes um, our initial initial idea was not to create uh, um, an excessively dangerous world or well to be specific to create a high mortality game mm -hmm. uh, because the world is thought to be yes extremely dangerous but you are a soul binder i mean you are not uh, your average joe swinging a sword around the countryside so uh it is not fitting for you to die with i don't know after two weeks mm -hmm. but uh on the other side we also wanted to avoid some of the problems we for others these are not problems we saw in the fifth edition of dungeon dragons for example so um the excessive use of healing powers for example or mm -hmm. the um the fact that at some points it points are just i don't know a vague description of your health mm, and considering that you have at your disposal a wide variety of tools to hit yourself to heal yourself quickly uh, we decided to create a wound system. So, uh, yes, uh, this was also to create a, uh, a deadlier combat system. Mm -hmm. um, plus, I, I um, I'm in I'm in the cam I'm in the camp of wanting to make sure criticals um, actually do more than just double damage. They actually cause pain. Um, but when it com now when it comes to the when it comes to the when it comes to the lan the lanterns um mm -hmm. since you, since obviously characters are going to be soul binders um 
what would what would be some of the broad strokes things that lanterns bring to, bring to the table f- when it comes to surviving mm. out out in the out in the wilderness? Yes. Um, so when creating uh, terminus, which is the the word of uh, ex lumina, we decided that we didn't want to have any kind of magic. Uh, in the initial drafts of Ex Lumine, actually, there were uh, magic schools, only three magic schools, mm. and there were also uh, the lanterns. But we immediately realized that the two ideas were conflicting because either you felt as a, I don't know, white mage or a soul binder. And mm-hmm. it was it was really weird because one one was um, Robin the Spotlight, uh, the other side and so we decided to just remove magic so everything you could expect from um, your standard magic powers in dnd for example you can get them from uh, the lanterns of power with some exceptions so it is not really a high magic system Uh, answering to your question there are some interesting powers uh, thought to be used to survive for example, uh, the most classic, classic ones, ones used to remove, I don't know, curses mm. or diseases or to uh, ease pain or uh, hunger or thirst. Uh, or, for example, the opposite uh, powers that can be used to curse a person or to uh, predict the weather uh, or to avoid the corrupted zones. Uh, uh, so yes, you have plenty of these powers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and of, of of course, I do I do see in the quick start that you that um that there are four there are four categories of lan- of lantern powers. Mm-hmm. Um, sa- um, sacred, elemental, forbidden, and apocryphal. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to those four are are they is it generally free form as far as as far as which powers could be um could be taken or at character creation would they have to specify um a a certain school certain school or schools of powers that they could that they could pick from Okay, that's an interesting question because uh, in the early drafts of Ex Lumine, mm-hmm. each so binder order, a class basically, had a specific uh, school uh, assigned to it, let's mm-hmm. just say. Um, but uh, after many playtesting sessions, we realized that was to that was actually a deterrent and it wasn't a good design. So we, in, when creating a character or, or, or when leveling up, leveling it up, for example, you uh, the game provides you with with the suggestions. So, for example, if you are if you are uh, a cleric from the Empire of the Humans, which is uh, a zealous and highly fanatically religious empire, mm-hmm. you are suggested to not take forbidden powers because that will be incoherent. Uh, without uh, with your background but for example on the other hand you have uh, for example inquisitors which make use of everything because everything is a tool as as uh, as long as you use it to serve a higher power so you have these uh, gray zones that the game master can use to say uh, well okay you're a human you maybe should not be able to learn this uh, elemental power because it is something that has to do with cans, but uh, maybe, I don't know, you served uh, 10 years uh, in the Great Crucible, the capital of the cans, and you can learn it. Yeah. So it can be, um, uh, it might be a little harder for new game masters because there's not a clear rule stating uh, this clan, this class can pick this and that class can pick that. But uh, we believe that this choice allows uh, overall greater longevity for the game. Yeah. And within now, within the um, pa- within the pa- within the um, power set power sets, is it 
is it a case where within 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 each of the um each of those each of those sets of powers that it's separated by tiers um or is it or is it a bit more um loose i think i think what i think what i'm asking is is how is how is it structured because you you were you're saying you wanted to minimize magic so i don't want so i'm hoping not to look at the uh, lantern powers um like a spell book uh no 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 um well uh we spent uh, a lot of time uh actually many months uh balancing things out which is mm -hmm. something that many games do not do and i can see why because because it can be too much of a hassle for a tabletop rpg mm -hmm. but we actually try to create a nice balance between all the powers and all the tiers so mm -hmm. every uh, power and every um, skill, which is an ability you can use, has three ranks. Uh, a journeyman, uh, a novice journeyman, and expert expert rank. You can acquire the same skill or the same lantern power uh, three times, empowering it. So for some powers, for example, I don't know, the classical uh, fireball, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, increases its its damage, but also it creates new effects. For example, you can choose to make it uh, ricochet against another target, or make the, making it explode, or ricochet around the corner, something like that. Mm -hmm. Some power drastically change, leveling them, so you can actually decide to use whenever you want the uh, lower rank of the power, because because maybe leveling it uh, grants you uh, a new way to use the same power. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the final version of the game provides uh, a fairly strict uh, rule about uh, when to give experience and how much. Mm -hmm. uh, this was to ensure balance, uh, mostly because um, different powers and abilities have different ex experience cost. And we calculated that um, an experienced character, let's just say with, uh, I don't know, uh, six months of playtime, mm -hmm. Uh, should acquire uh, on the average uh, three skills at the second level or one skill maxed out and the other mm -hmm. two novice and uh, two or three powers. So yes, uh, it kind of acts like a spell book, but you never have uh, actually more than uh, two or three powers because we don't we didn't want to overwhelm the players with uh, uh, tons of choices or uh, or, or list of spells. I mean, you have to uh, to get through uh, more than uh, eighty powers actually, but when choosing them, actually, no, not when using them. Yeah. And speaking speaking of experience, um, I'm. Would it be fair of me to, to assume that you guys are using a experience as currency method of advancement and not a level or tier based one uh yes uh initially there was a milestone system uh but it was difficult to um balance the milestone idea with the idea of balancing the cost of um uh, powers and skills so we went with uh, yes experience as currency mm -hmm. and to and now, when it comes to when it comes to skills, um, given that I mentioned war, the Warhammer comparison earlier, um, would it be accurate of me to say that the way um, skills work skills work is when you first take a skill, you can use that you can use that particular skill without getting penalized, and taking it further means that the um, attribute that you would that you would roll would be high, would be rolled as higher than it actually is. Uh, for some skills, yes, but this is not um, applicable to all the skills. Most skills just give you, um, let's just say, uh, new ways to use your attributes. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, by acquiring the shield fighting skills, 
it uh, not only gives you, for example, a plus five when blocking with a shield, but it gives you, for example, an ability to uh, daze a target whenever you block a hit or to defend uh, um, a teammate whenever he's fighting uh, near you. So we wanted to create this uh, dynamic approach. Uh, I tried for, I tried so much trying to uh, avoiding the classical. Or, well, I get to a, I get a new skill. It is just a plus five. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to create this kind of situation, so we went with a more. Mm, I, I will not say narrative, more dynamical approach, something like that, more tabletop uh, war gaming approach, something like that. I, I will. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to describe. It. Yeah, and. With now, um, with that with that in mind, since since I mentioned the whole thing with powers, I want to tackle the other half of that equation with um soul bounds. Mm. Um. Yes. Now, I seem to re I seem to recall re reading a thing that soul bounds were a um a means to um reward to reward team to reward team play. Is mm -hmm. that is that the case? And how how did it come about? Um, well, yes, when creating the soul binder orders, the classes, I decided instinctively there wasn't really uh, anything else but mm, my gut feelings that I had to create something to uh, reward team play, or at least not necessarily team play, but interesting uh, interaction between the players. Mm. For example, um, there's one soul bound uh, that you can form between two soul binders, and when when one of the two dies, uh, it is transformed into a into a wraith under the control of the other. So, of course, whenever you are uh, soul bound, um, you get interesting uh, bonuses. So it is not just like that. But whenever you die, you also I mean basically lose your freedom and become a wraith under the control of the other soul binder. So uh, most soul bounds were created to promote team play, yes, but some also to create interesting interaction. For example, there's another soul binder which can use basically psionic powers, but at the cost of uh, his sanity. But as long as he is bound with another soul binder within reach, I should say, uh, these uh, maluses are lessened and this does not provide any bonuses for the other so binder the one that's not using the psionic powers but it creates um interaction because uh, why should i bind with this dude basically using his mind to uh, destroy our foes i mean uh, why is is he my friend is he my i don't know is from my order uh, and that's it. So we wanted to create mechanics that uh, created this kind of interaction. Mm -hmm. um, now with now with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, I did want I did want to ask a bit on um, on char on character creation. Um, now in now. Obvious, obviously, I'm, w I'm well aware that this kind of thing is is likely in flux. But when it com when it comes to when it comes to um creation, um how how much of a how much of a factor does the does the type of does the type of um type of soul binder you you play as i.e. the um i.e. the fa Within the factions, are there um, so are there subtypes of binders? Well, actually, it plays a huge part. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as I said previously, this was this was done almost entirely to, um, I just say, follow a narrative design from this point of view. Uh, so, for example, uh, among all the five races, the humans are the only ones. For example, that can cure uh, corruption because they uh, they are specialized in that. 
and they have clerics that can do only that. Um, but um, um, this is not only the important part of um, creating your character, mm -hmm. I think, because character creation actually it is a lengthy process, but also very important and fun, I think. Uh, it saddened me that it does not transpire from a quick starter because mm -hmm. you have characters that are, well, pre-generated and there are no uh, racial abilities in the um, in the quick starter. But for example, when creating a, a character, you follow 12 steps. So the whole process is thought to be done in group with the game master uh, sit, uh, set at the table. So um, at first, the game master explain, explains the type of campaign he's going to, uh, to play, to play out, and the um, players uh, answer questions or decide accordingly what kind of character to play. Then they choose their race and they allocate the basic stats among the six attributes and choose uh, um, their soul binder order, which is a class. Um, as you said, there are a total of uh, uh, 15 uh, orders. Each one has, e has its unique uh, power and soul bound. And I can confidently say that there are no um, two soul binder orders equals. I mean, you have the fire warrior, in mm -hmm. the cans, which is a completely different warrior from the, uh, I don't know, the Zealot Crusader in the Human Empire. Because one focuses around defending his teammates, the other uh, focuses around wielding a blade made of fire. So there are two entirely different concepts. Of course, you don't have, uh, with this kind of approach, you lose the uh, freedom of D&D. I mean, you create a warrior in D&D, you can create almost every kind of warrior you have, you want. Here it is more, uh, I should say, uh, embedded in the, uh, in the world. I mean, you, you can choose to create mm -hmm. whatever cleric you want. You create the cleric of the human empire, which is trained to do that thing. Then you can customize it however you want. And this is the interesting part of the uh, character creation. Uh, because uh, you choose then your racial ability because undergoing the retail of binding which gives you uh, your lantern uh, let's just say that um, it awakens uh, your dormant bloodline which has been tainted, tainted by corruption corruption mm -hmm. so for example a can might uh, uh, develop uh, the ability to wield the two two-handed weapons because mm -hmm. he finds himself considerably larger after the ritual or for example uh, a scarred uh, can found himself addic addicted to souls of the, the ritual because the tenebrous blood awakens in his body mm -hmm. and so you have this kind of uh, racial mm, abilities and uh, characteristics and traits that you uh, randomly generate or choose from a list uh, from the race you have chosen. There are a total of six racial abilities per race and six uh, racial flaws per race. So there, there is a lot to um, tackle around when creating a character. And uh, the last two important things of character creation are the um, Order's Oath, so every soul binder must choose an oath, which basically uh, works as uh, I usually say an improved inspiration system. So you choose an oath who, that can be something like uh, um, I will complete this task for my master or I will eradicate the tenebris. And when the uh, oath um, is triggered, for example, my oath is I will defend my partner and he's about to get hit. I can uh, either reroll a dice or inspire a friend to let him reroll a dice or perform an action outside my turn. Mm -hmm. And again, this was done to create interesting, interesting situation even in combat. So we wanted to avoid the classical scenario in which uh, initiative, I do my thing, 
-hmm. turn over, it is uh, the other player's turns. I can do anything. Uh, of course, there are limitations. You can um, act act based in, uh, act basing on your oath whenever you want, but that's the core idea. And lastly, uh, borrowed from Warhammer, the last edition, we uh, created something that we called uh, um, uh, party aptitude. Mm -hmm. So, uh, according to the idea of the game master campaign, you choose a party aptitude. For example, one aptitude is called uh, party synergy. So, one synergy is called uh, Battle Brothers, and this allows uh, players to perform group actions in combat. For example, to um, surround a group of enemies. Another one is called another synergy is called diplomats. So you mm -hmm. can perform uh, group tests uh, with the charm attribute to, well, basically do what diplomats do. <laughs> and again, these were done to create uh, uh, scenarios in which uh, the whole group can do something, not just the single individual. Mm -hmm. Now, speak, speaking of that, um, in war, in um. Obviously in Warhammer, obviously in Warhammer and if, and some of the other games mentioned, there's sometimes a form of extra effort um, mechanics. Um, in Warhammer, of course, they had they had um, fate points. Um, so, um, something like Shadowrun has Edge, and there's a few other examples. Um, are there any plans to do something similar to that in Ex Lumine? Um, yes. But uh, our fear is that um, adding another mechanic would considerably um, slow the game or open up too many possibilities of, um, well, possibly, let's just say, ruining the balancing. Because at the moment you have uh, a lot of lantern powers that can be used as a reaction. So, for example, in, in desperate times or in a situation in which you should not be able to act, you have the order oath, which al at, at the moment allow it allows you to perform actions in times whenever you should not be able to. For example, after suffering a damage or to save a dying companion, and adding another kind of mechanics would uh, uh, I don't know. It, it seems too much to me, so I don't think we will create something uh, like this. Yeah. Um, now, when, now, um, when it comes to when it comes to equipment, would it be fair of me to say that you are aiming for a lighter approach, where the only the only where the only equipment being tracked is the stuff that's actually important, and the rest is um is just treated in a narrative sense? Yes, absolutely. Uh, as I said uh, at the beginning, we wanted to. Uh, avoid excessive crunchiness mm -hmm. um there are some crunchy section i should say in the com in the final version for example you can uh, become an artisan using soul to craft uh, uh, items uh, weapons and armor mm -hmm. for example and that part can be crunch I mean, you can create your own type of gun, for example, choosing, I don't know, uh, the barrel, the hand grip, uh, its power cell, uh, I don't know, any kind of modification. But that ob obviously not the core of the game. It was done for two reasons. First, to allow uh, personalization. And secondly, to let the master know, well, this is what... Uh, this is about the world. I mean, uh, there are artisan artisans in the in this world that can do this, um, but everything is so is rather simple. For example, as I say, creating a gun can be rather crunchy, but th there are no um, there are not many numbers to remember. There are no particular tests to make. I mean, you just make a, a wit check. Mm -hmm. And if you succeed, you create your gun without uh, any difficulty or something like that. Yeah. And when it comes to when it, com when it comes to that kind that kind of creation, since you mentioned firearms, I'm guess 
considering that you wanted to minimize crunch, I'm guessing that um, that players wouldn't have to finagle to what to worry about whether or not they have enough bullets. No, no, no. I mean, there are suggestions in the in the game master's manual uh, where the professions are described. In which, for example, it is stated that a normal power cell should last for, I don't know, um, 100 shots. And okay, but you don't actually, you don't have actually to track them, uh, so you don't have to track arrows or something like that. No, the only things you have to track about uh, equipment are uh, the resources you uh, must spend to survive in the wilderness and. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, uh, that's it. Uh, armor has no durability. Um, there are no... Well, the, the character sheet is actually quite simple, so there's not much to track about. Yeah. And... Well, part, part, of, the re part of the reason that I ask is, in, in, some cases, the, in some cases, that'll be... That ends up being a, fa that ends up being a factor... In other in other cases, they do the approach of no, you don't have to worry about bullets, but you still need to worry about re but about um, how many shots you can do before you have to reload, um, or in some cases, standard ammo being you don't have to worry about, but specialized ammo you do. Um, so it's it's one of those things that I'm all, that I'm always curious about. Um, especially especially since i can i could easily see a campaign going where somebody where somebody creates um spe specialized bu specialized bullets based on their particular style like ones if somebody wanted to create ones that are get that could easily set things on fire mm -hmm. um now when it now um when it comes to when it comes when it comes to that cre that creation process, um, would you, how um, how min how inv is it a is it a case where it would just be where it would just be one si one simple um, die die roll or how in how more involved how more involved would the steps be depending on how simple or complex the item being made is. Mm. Well, actually, the die roll is involved in the creation of the item, mm -hmm. but uh, there are no degrees of successes or failures in creating the item. So it is not that if you roll exceptionally high, you create a more powerful item. No, we wanted to, we avoided this kind of approach. It is rather, it is simpler. The, uh, let's just say, crunchy part is in actually choosing what and how to craft mm -hmm. um, but not in the die roll it is just a simple die roll and with and take taking that die with that with that kind of thing in mind um when cre when creating that would would the currency would the currency the cost of creation be um in be in souls it is usually uh, both souls and um, coins usually or special uh, reagents uh, for example uh, uh, a blacksmith can create a special kind of weapons uh, and armors infu infused with uh, specific powers obtained from monsters. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so yes. So there are three uh, different kinds of reagents: money, souls, and special reagents. Yeah. And when and um, when it comes to when it comes to the, when it comes to those, I'm I'm guessing that. In the um, create in the creation methods, it'll li it'll list out what would be required for each. Yes. Yes. Which mess around.
with? Well, for example, there, uh, there is this kind of uh, giant uh, mutated scorpion, mm -hmm. which is highly venomous. And uh, if you can kill it, which is actually a rather hard task, you can uh, uh, extract a, a gland from, uh, from it and use it to craft uh, uh, with coins and souls uh, a special armor which allows you to uh, basically become immune against poisons uh, for a small uh, amount of time. Uh, the uh, final armor, which can be whatever you want according to the reagents you use, for example, leather, steel, uh, iron, or iron, or something like that, uh, will have this property and uh, will be usable, usable by both those who crafted it and those who, who want to use it. There are no armor restrictions, so um, everyone can wear every kind of armor, but uh, of mm -hmm. course, heavier hammers have, uh, associate, are associated with uh, maluses to uh, agility and uh, other attributes. Yeah. And when it comes now, I know I meant, I know I asked earlier about some adva about advancement and I think you mentioned you're going for an XP approach. Um, is, is it good? Um, when it comes when it comes to the things that you can get with uh, with that XP, is it mainly j is it mainly just attribute skills and um po and powers, or are there or are there other things that you can spend with experience? Um. Well, we didn't like the idea, um, for example, of the uh, third edition of Dungeons and Dragons to spend XP to craft items which was a huge deal in the third edition. We didn't like it. We felt that uh, experience should be used only to uh, acquire new skill or empower already existing ones and lantern powers. Uh, actually, you can't uh, um, evolve, let's just say, your attributes in uh, any way except with the professions or with the temporary uh, effects for of course so uh, at the moment you can spend experience only to level skills and powers yes um i'm get i'm guessing when it comes to when it comes to powers are they are are they um are they fire and forget or are there, or are there ways to tweak their effects mm. Uh, what do you mean? Um, like if some if somebody acquired, what I mean by tweaking is um be, is being able to um upgrade or modify the effects of individual powers. Mm -hmm. Whereas fire and forget is a ca is a case of um that one that one power will once you acquire it it'll always act that way no exceptions. Uh, okay, I see. Um. Well, yes and no, uh, because some powers uh, are actually the same across uh, the, th the three tiers. For example, they just become stronger and that's it. Uh, other powers, uh, most of them actually, uh, have some form of liberty. For example, there is an elemental power that allows you to create an elemental circle of the chosen element, uh, air, electricity, fire, or... Um, stone or dirt, but uh, it doesn't really. Uh, it gives you an accurate description of, of what you can do and some limitation. But you can do whatever you want. And um, for example, you can you could create a line rather than a circle around you, for example, or a straight line just to hit an enemy. And uh, leveling it uh, not only empowers the uh, effects of the elements, for example, a fire. A wall of fire will do more damage, but also allows to manipulate the fire in a better way. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, the and most of the times, actually, uh, leveling up a power or a, or a skill actually adds another layer on that power or skills, allowing you to perform mm -hmm. and not necessarily an improved version of your uh, of the power, but to perform something else. 
So uh, most of the times when you have uh, um, a power a, le a power leveled up at tier three, you don't you not only have that power which is now stronger, you have multiple options of what you can do with that power. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes now, um, when it comes to when it comes now, you mentioned that the main that um. The main way to upgrade attributes is is with um, professions. Um, when someone when someone picks a a um, profession starting out, is that is that the profession is that the profession that they're going to have for their ent entire career, or are there advanced versions of professions that they could qualify into? Um, well, professions are mm -hmm. just technically skills. Yeah. So you acquire. Uh, um, the uh, soul-bound engineering skill at mm -hmm. the novice rank, which allows you to create only specific uh, recipes or uh, modifications. And when you acquire the higher skills, you unlock, uh, let's just say, unlock more recipes or uh, and the modification for your uh, guns and rifles. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can choose actually any number of professions you want. I will not uh, suggest it, but you can do it if you want. And they are actually quite powerful, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so yes. Yeah. And when it comes to races, do they? Um, do, how much of a factor do they play in, ter in terms of what pro in terms of what professions would be easier or more difficult to um, learn? Well. Um, Thematically, racist, mm -hmm. racist would play a huge part, but uh, in the actual rules, mm, no. I mean, you can create um, uh, a can with a high intelligence and be an expert uh, engineer as much mm -hmm. as, as a human, uh, even though the humans actually invented the idea of uh, creating a um Weapons and vehicles, uh, soul power, but mm, there are no uh, differences from the rules point of view. All right. Now, when it comes to when it, when it comes to the um, the mo when it comes to the monsters that that are within that are within um, Tenebris. Um, I'm go obviously there's go obviously there's going to be a bestiary within within the book, but do you have do you have plans? On put on putting some sort of system so that a uh, GM could create custom monsters. Uh, well, actually, yes. Uh, right now, uh, I'm working on a system uh, to create this kind of uh, scenarios. Mm -hmm. So you have this uh, bestiary with uh, a list of tenebris and other creatures typical of the world, and we want to create a system where you can actually create your corrupted creature mm -hmm. it will have uh, keywords and uh, randomized systems uh, to help uh, dungeon master but it mm -hmm. will be a rather in-depth system yes which that make that makes sense um and get given given that is it would it be based on a um on a kind of xp on a kind of xp budget i.e um I, I um, a certain amount, a certain amount of XP to for um for that for that particular power tier of of monster, where giving it stronger attributes or more effects would um would result would require a higher amount of XP. Mm, uh, it will be that uh, these keywords mm -hmm. and attributes and. Uh, special abilities will be divided into something Uh, that will not be a number, but a vague indication, for example, uh, hard, uh, impossible, uh, trivial, or something like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I can de I can definitely get I can definitely get behind something like that. Um Now, I real now you guys had you get your team had put out the quick the um quick start fairly recently. Um Do you have do you have plans to la to launch X Luminae on on um Kickstarter in the coming months or are you aiming for a straight full release? Uh we want to release uh, we want to uh, to approach the Kickstarter world, but uh, in the next year, I think. So maybe January or February, yes. First, we want to release, the, um, let's just say, another form of Kickstarter, uh, just focused around the character creation process. Because uh, at the time, uh, the Kickstarter serves as an introduction for the rules and the world itself, but it, it does not uh, give justice to the character creation system. And we want to also show that so um, players and masters know what they are dealing with. All right, that that makes sense. Um, do you have a release for that second for that second quick start? Would that be um, some? Would that be put out sometime next year around around the time that you would launch it? No, actually, we are uh, um, we are going to release it uh, in the next month, I think. Mm -hmm. um, we are um, we are <laughs> that's arriving soon. All right. Um, now the now the current one runs at about runs at about seventy two pages. Would that other one be around the same size, or would it be um, bigger? It will be uh, around. Uh, uh 20 or 30 pages but it will it will contain only uh a portion of the so binder orders of the five races so for example you could have two orders two classes for each race mm -hmm. uh, so you get an idea uh, of how different races uh, approach the so binder theme and mostly would be descriptions and tables for example tables including uh, racial quirks and flaws and uh, the oaths uh, i talked earlier earlier mm -hmm. now and i'll i'll definitely be um, look i'll definitely be looking forward to to that um with all that in mind i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to Come up to come all the way up to the temple and enjoy, and enjoy the insanity at play here. <laughs> Thank you for inviting uh, me. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> um, and of and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the show. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!